We're going to get started. Um, isn't this crazy? I have these two glasses, and I keep pulling them both off. I don't know which one to wear. I never thought I'd be at that point where you, where you just can't see anything. So um, I'm there. I want to introduce to you William L. Kovacs. Now, he tells me, Kovacs, is that right? He tells me that there was a famous comedian, Eddie Kovacs. And uh, how many of you remember that guy? Okay, I can't see you. I'll put my glasses on. You can raise your hand again. Okay, quite a few. Of, well, was he really pretty funny? I bet he wasn't as funny as I am, huh? What's he famous for? Okay, okay. Well, this guy uh, is not a comedian, but... Mr. Kovacs is the Vice President of Environmental Technology and Regulatory Affairs United States Chamber, with the United States Chamber of Commerce. He provides the overall direction, strategy, and management for this division of the Chamber and has transformed it from a small concentration of a few issues and committee meetings into one of the most significant in the organization. He is a frequent commentator on national environmental energy and regulatory issues that impact the business community and is regularly quoted in the nation's leading newspapers. He also appears on talk radio and television as a spokesperson for American business. He has a law degree from Ohio State Univers University College of Law and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Scranton, magna cum laude. Please welcome with you, with me, William Kovacs. Thanks very much, and thanks for that uh, kind introduction. And, and uh, before I start, I want to thank the um, center for having me here. This is their inaugural uh, conference, and. Uh, You've hit quite a, quite a timely topic, uh, but more than anything, uh, I'm really not here to talk about energy. I'm here to talk about what the U.S. Congress is thinking in terms of limitations on energy, and that issue is, is climate change. Because all of climate change is literally about how we are going to reduce the use of fossil fuels. So as we address this, we let me see if I've got this. Okay, let's, there we go. Is this it? Yes, no, I have to go back. I'm sorry, here we go. The, um, as we talk about climate change, let me give you an overview of what the issue is and a as we walk into it, because climate change is about what they say is the increasing temperature of the earth caused by human activity. And so the solution for that that's being proposed is to begin reducing the amount of CO2s that are generated by society. And most of the carbon dioxide comes from our use of energy, whether it be oil, coal, uh, or natural gas. And right now, the, the amount of energy, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 375 parts per million. I'm just sort of going to blow through the facts. And because of the demand, and you'll see charts on this, the demand for energy, this is expected to rise over time to about 800 parts per million. And the environmentalists say that if you can't limit it at about 550 parts per million, then we're going to have many of the catastrophes uh, that they talk about. I'm not going to get in, okay, I'm not going to get into a debate on any of the science. But when you think about climate change, the discussion, as I've mentioned, focuses on really the reduction of CO2s. Are we going to cap, are, 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 you've heard the word cap and trade, are we going to cap the amount of CO2 that we use? Are we going to impose a carbon tax? But there are really two other parts to the climate debate that are absolutely essential. Uh, the first is, what are going to be the replacement fuels? And in every piece of legislation that we've discussed, they talk about reducing our use of carbon, uh, carbon and fossil fuels over about 50 years, but there's not one mention of a policy that would drive a replacement fuel. And then third, 
we've talked a lot about the NIMBYs today, or the bananas, or the nopes. But what we didn't talk about is how do you get these replacement fuels into society? Now, it's easy when we talk about coal. About 65 coal plants have had their permits denied this year because they didn't address CO2. We've also had seven major wind projects, and now we're having solar projects. So the position as we move forward is there's a limitation on the energy that we have today, and we're going to reduce that by roughly about 70 percent over 40 years. There's no discussion of a replacement fuel, and there is absolutely no discussion as to how we get that replacement fuel into uh, society. So if we look at the relationship between the world energy demand and emissions, what we find out is the world wants energy. It's fairly simple. You've seen this chart several times today. Business as usual takes this, and as you can see from around the year 2000, we actually triple the amount of energy that the world is going to need. The United States is going to need in the next 40 years about 40 percent more energy. The rest of the world is going to need several hundred percent more energy. So you end up with some of the major conflicts of rich versus poor, developing versus developed, food versus non-food, uh, do we use food for fuel? And these are debates that go well beyond what is going on in the United States. But the key chart here, and I'm going to focus on this one, because this does this work. Uh, this, this is the chart that makes the most impression on, on everyone. If you look right here at this particular line, that is where we are today. This blue, right above this blue line is a line that separates the developed world from the developing world. So as you can see, our energy use going out over time is going to gradually increase by this 40%. Theirs is going to go up approximately 300%. If you literally m could make the, the developed world disappear, this is what the issue is. If you said the United States and Europe and Japan and Australia and Canada no longer exist, you would still have a rise over the next century of 300% in terms of CO2 emissions. That's the issue that we face. So when you talk about a domestic policy to cap and trade, what you're saying is we literally are going to stop using energy and we're not going to address the replacement energy. So when we manage climate change, I think the impression is in the United States that the United States is doing very little. In fact, if you look very quickly at this, this chart, which is about as clear as we can define it, you find you, you find on the left-hand side, right there, uh, the fact that within Congress, they're already dealing with the Lieberman-Warner climate change bill. Last year, we passed an energy bill which dealt with the renewable fuels portion of climate change, and we can see where we've gotten to. We've moved, or we've doubled or tripled the amount of ethanol that we're going to use, supposedly it would reduce the CO2, and we've put more and more problems into the world food supply. Then, right here, We've got the Environmental Protection Agency, which is beginning to regulate CO2 as a pollutant. If it makes a finding that it, that it endangers public health, and, and, and some of the environmentalists argue that it will, every single permit that anyone needs to get to build a facility or to modify a facility that emits 100 tons of CO2, to give you an idea, that's a new Burger King that has a gas stove it's 13 houses, they will have to get these special permits. These special permits take about 18 months to get, but they come into it and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they will take, right now, we file tens of thousands of permits, it will take it into the hundreds of thousands of permits. It will literally, literally cripple the agency. The agency will not be able to act, and that's what's going on today in the rulemaking, right in, in that column. And then over here, the thing that's most fascinating about that column is, is that the environmentalists have decided to take on every single project in the entire United States that relates to energy or has a carbon component. 
And so a lot of you have probably read the articles on the polar bear. And the polar bear is right over there. The polar bear is fascinating because their argument with the polar bear was any place that, C that emits CO2, and that's a coal-fired power plant in New Mexico, impacts the ice sheets in Alaska. And so therefore, once you find the polar bear threatened, you have to literally put every single major project that has a CO2 component into a consultation process with the agencies that could mitigate against harming the polar bear. And so if you're going to build a new highway in New Mexico, under the environmentalist argument, you are impacting the polar bear. That's what the federal courts found. The agency now is trying to have some kind of a special exemption and only apply it to Alaska, but literally the day they file the special exemption, the day after the environmentalist sued. Uh, right now, we've also got over here on ocean acidification. Uh, the argument there is that CO2 acidifies the ocean so that all of the states that are coastal, while it wouldn't affect New Mexico, have to now again begin taking measures to stop CO2 within the state. So if you look at where the United States is, right now on CO2, you have legislation moving forward in the Senate, you have EPA doing rulemaking, and you have an enormous amount of litigation, all of which will literally limit the emissions that might come out, or that would come out, of any fossil fuels. Now, how does it look for the future? Our three presidential candidates all support cap and trade. Uh, the only difference is some have fewer reductions uh, than others, and we'll get to this in a moment, and Clinton and Obama want any allocations, and I'll, let me see if I can explain this, to be auctioned off. An allocation under the cap and trade proposal is where the government says, we will allow you so many credits so you can emit, hundred, let's say, 100 tons. And anything beyond 100 tons, you have to get either reduce your use of fossil fuels or you have to buy a credit from somewhere else. So if you get 100 tons of credits from the government, that means at least you can produce up to 100 tons of CO2. You'll have to purchase the next credit after the 100 tons. In the Obama bill and the Clinton bill, they both would require you to purchase credits from day one. And these credits are going to be relatively expensive. They could range from a low of $25, $30 a ton, and they could range to a high of three, four hundred dollars a ton. And uh, as my friend John Felmy always says, uh, 100, I think it's 100 tons of, uh, of CO2 equals $1 in gasoline in charges for gasoline so it gives you an idea at 100 at 100 dollars a ton at 100 tons you're putting in another you're putting in another dollar immediately the um, I'm just going to skip that here's the chart that's probably the most important cuz we're talking about allocations and I know you can't see this but what's so essential about this is the congress and Warner Lieberman literally takes the entire society and it allocates credits to them. So, for example, if you're in the fossil fuel power generating plant, you would get, for the, for the first year, 18% of the credits. If you're a company that uh, is in um, wildlife adaptation, you get 2% of the credits. So they have allocated credits throughout the entire society. They've given an enormous amount of credits, about 30% of the credits, literally to state local governments and sort of public functions like protecting wildlife, which means that 30, since they're not producing CO2s, those credits can be sold. So when you re-look at the chart, what you see is, for example, 12.75% um, of all the credits, and I'm going to translate this into dollars, would go to assistance for consumers. If you totaled up all the various ways you would assist consumers, again, you're getting about 30% of the credits for assisting consumers. So now we'll stop the surprise and go to the next chart. On this chart, what this does is it talks about the auction. If you're going to continue in business, if you're going to continue selling oil and gas, 
the number of credits allocated, the percent of credits allocated to oil and gas is 2%. If you're, uh, for example, if you're saving wildlife, you get 5% of the credits. So what this means to the oil and gas industry is from the day cap and trade legislation starts, you have to buy credits in order to produce your product. You are, in a sense, at a full auction from day one. And so what is this auction going to raise? So you've got an idea of the magnitude. If you go with the Lieberman-Warner bill as it's drafted today, you have 30 years of, of allocated credits that are free, and then you have the auction so that some of you can continue uh, in business. The auction over the time period will raise $3.3 trillion. The value of the allowances that are being allocated to the industry to continue your productive activities are roughly $3.4 trillion. So if you add up the two groups, in other words, if an Obama type or a Clinton type candidate won and they wanted a full auction, the full cost of the auction to be borne exclusively by industry that generates CO2 will be $7.7 .7 trillion. And you will have to begin, especially in the oil and gas industry and in the coal industry, you'll have to begin buying these credits immediately because they're only going to go, they're only going to go up. So what's the economic impact of, of, of this? Um, the Lieberman Warner Bill has been fairly well modeled. And again, you, you can't see it, but it, we, the, the economists break this down into several categories. The first category is, what is the price of carbon? And the price of carbon by 2020 per ton would be roughly between $30 and $76. Uh, and, and that's across the board on, on all the studies. Uh, by 2030, the price of carbon would go from $56 to $270. $271, that literally would be $2.71 uh, per gallon of gas. The impacts on the GDP range from a low, uh, an, an annual low of $151 billion uh, by 2020 to an annual high of $506 billion, and by 2030 it rises from a low of $300 billion to a high of $998 billion. Anyway, the, the, the issue here is not whether the studies are correct or not. No one's arguing that any one study is correct. What they're arguing is, is that if you, and we had all the economists at the chamber to talk about it, what they're arguing about is if you take all the studies and look at all the assumptions, they come out very similar. Some assume that, that we're going to have an enormous amount of nuclear. Uh, the studies that, are, that, that produce the lowest value for carbon make several assumptions. Nuclear is going to come in at 200 percent of where it is today. We're going to have carbon capture and sequestration within 12 years. Uh, that we're going to have far more biofuels and biomass into the marketplace. Now, the next study, let's see if I can get to this slide, because um, I'm going to just skip that. Uh, I want to. I want to just. Uh, this is the study. What What's so pertinent here is that if you look on this chart, these are three separate studies. Now, going across the top, it's business as usual. So you can see CO2 is rising with with energy use. Now, these gray areas here are what they call energy reduction. Energy reduction, in very simple terms, means we stop using energy. Now, you can see in the two, it's very little. There's energy reduction in all of the studies, but in this one, it's far greater. This is the study done by MIT, and MIT said, we're only going to ask one question. If we don't get 200% of the nuclear into the waste, into the energy mix, what's going to happen? And all of a sudden, you can see right now, and to bring it down to 450 parts per million, we would have to have a 60% reduction by 2020 in our amount of energy. And here, at 550 parts per million, we would have to end up basically with a reduction of somewhere around 38, 39%. I'm going to go, 
I'm going to go back a few and then I'll come forward. The, um, so how big is our task? How high is, how high is the mountain? Well, the mountain is, is, is really high because if you look at the slide, there are, what this slide does is, in very simple terms, it takes your energy use, which is where we were today in 2000, and it says roughly we're, we're generating about 26 gigatons a year of carbon. That's projected over time by 2050 right here to rise to 50.6 gigatons. To meet what Lieberman Warner is asking us to do by 2050, we would have to have our carbon use down to here or we would have to have roughly a 76 percent reduction in fossil fuel use. Now to put this in really simple terms, worldwide what this would mean is that if we were going to get to this by the end of the century, we would have to produce today 30 to 40 terawatts of new non-fossil fuel energy, wind, solar, carbon capture, whatever. That is three to four times the amount of energy that is presently used and generated on Earth today by fossil fuels. So that gives you an idea. So when, when, when people begin to talk to you about what it is that we have to do to meet the CO2 reduction levels, we literally have to produce three to four times more energy than exists on Earth today. So when we talk about what are the replacement fuels, and then we begin to talk about how do we get them in, we're not going to be able to have a NIMBY and a banana and everything else if we have a replacement fuel like nuclear. It is going to have to be streamlined and put into the marketplace as quick as humanly possible. And it's not going to have to be done just in the United States. It's going to have to be done worldwide. Um, so what's the future technology mix? You've seen charts like this. This is a little bit, I mean, actually, the, the, some of the charts today we use are almost identical, but this is flipped a little bit to give you an idea of what it is. The world as we know it today is somewhere around here, and you can see the traditional mix. It's oil, gas, coal, a little bit of solar, 18% uh, nuclear, whatever it is. And the technologies of tomorrow, which are really over here, they don't exist. You, you see oil and gas and coal going up really to, to about mid-century. Somewhere around 2025, you, see, you begin to see a little bit more nuclear, a little bit more biomass. But by and large, until 2050, it's the same mix in society as we have today. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we have an energy future beyond 2050, you're going to see oil going down. You're going, to see, you're going to see all of this area here is all coal and carbon capture and sequestration, oil and carbon capture and sequestration, gas and carbon capture and sequestration. And then it's going to be added to with nuclear and biomass. So you can see that in the future, if we don't get the nuclear or the biomass, just lump off that amount of energy. So when we talk about this, we have to talk in really practical ways because people aren't aren't focused on the practical ways. Talking about reducing CO2s and taking fossil fuels out is a ridiculous concept without talking about what are the replacement fuels and how do we get those replacement fuels into uh, society. So what are the lessons that, that we've learned? We've done studies literally across focus groups across the country. And the American public, the one thing that's really remarkable about the American public is they really are smarter than the politicians. And they look at it and say, wait a second, we really need energy, we can't take it out. Second, we're paying a lot for our energy, we're not looking for another dollar or two dollar tax, because I didn't even get into some of the projections on electricity. Those prices rise over the next 20 years from 46% to 146%. So it's not gonna be a question of just gas for your cars, it's gonna be a question of gas for your cars, heating and cooling for your houses. It's a question of a fundamental change in society because energy is going to become very, very expensive unless we have these new replacement fuels. And, you know, without being too conspiratorial, I mean, part of what is going on is with the environmental movement is they're pushing more and more fuels out. They're making projects harder and harder to cite. 
but correspondingly, they're not working with anyone to get new, new power sources in, even if it's nuclear or, or even, frankly, uh, uh, on wind. But what the American public have said is, look, yeah, it's a problem. We think it's probably a, a significant problem, but it's also an engineering problem. It's a science problem. It's a technology problem, and we can do it. Second, we've, we've paid already for this. And third, we want cooperation. And I think that's the biggest statement that anyone can make, that if we are going to win this battle, we have to do it in a cooperative way. We are never going to get cooperation from the environmental groups. They are never, ever, ever going to allow nuclear to, to easily enter the system. They're not going to, frankly, allow a large-scale wind into the system. But what we have to do is we have to be honest and say, OK, we're going to address climate change, but we need these other technologies. And one of the most important things when you talk about technology is everyone thinks, well, we aren't doing it. We've heard today the money that the oil industry puts in and the electric industry they do. Well, in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, 64 technologies were selected as the technologies of the future. And they were given an authorization of about $40 billion. Now, $40 billion. The, the Congress is comfortable today putting on a $3.7 trillion tax. They don't blink and they say it's in the public good, but they won't fund $40 billion of new technologies. Fully two-thirds of the technologies in the Energy Policy Act were not, were not covered. Um, so where are we going with this? It's very interesting. On the international side, there are more things going on than, than, than people can imagine. Uh, we've got the G8 summit that's going on this summer. We've got the, uh, uh, what they call the Asia-Pacific Partnership. Most of these are addressed towards finding some way to begin driving technology uh, into the system. The main obstacle on the international front is two things. One, the Europeans, and two, uh, the environmentalists. They both want cap and trade. They seem to think that that's great. Let me just leave you with one thought as I finish up my last couple of slides. The reason why the Europeans like cap and trade so much is that when they initiated their cap and trade, they didn't know how to measure carbon. We still don't know how to measure carbon. So they ended up just making guesses, and they generally got about two times the emissions than they needed. So they ended up with a whole pile of emissions, emission credits that they would like to sell. And guess what? Lieberman Warner allows us to buy 15% of those credits so over, every year. So over time, we will be paying with very low, very cheap dollars, or very expensive dollars in this case. We will be buying with our dollar, we will be buying credits from the Europeans. So they're going to get a nice deal. And this is part of the political landscape. In terms of the um, in terms of where we are with the congressional aspect, uh, we've got hearings, we've got the agencies, uh, we've said enough about that. And in terms of uh, the business community, look, at the end of the day, um, climate change, if it's real, has to be addressed. It has to be. And we can't sit here and, and keep our, our heads in the sand. And, and the way the debate has been shaped so far is we've had the people in the debate saying climate change isn't real, the science doesn't justify it. And what happens is they are completely dismissed from the argument because you're a denier. Rather than doing that, it's much easier to say, okay, we're going to address it. Let me tell you why. I, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter whether we're reducing CO2 for climate change purposes, or we're developing new forms of energy because the world needs 300% more energy. So what, what, what we're, the argument we're making is you can do both. We need more energy we, because we're not taught, this energy is going to come online 50 years from now. And so we need, in a very practical way, to, 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 to begin more engaged in the battle. And instead of just fighting the fact that reductions without replacement energy is foolish, they don't even care about that. They are looking at a three trillion, $3.3 trillion tax. $800 billion of that is going to go to the farmers who just got $300 billion last week. Well over a trillion dollars is going to go to state and local government in some form, whether it be in emission credits. And the way this will work is they're going to take the credits that would, net, would go, let's say, to worker training. They would sell the credits and then fund the programs. So we're finding ourselves putting together a structure in, in the Lieberman-Warner bill 
where you literally, where they're literally planning on the destruction, because they talk about it, this is how the formula works, the planning that the implementation of this bill will destroy manufacturing jobs in the United States, so they want to take three or four hundred billion dollars from that and train people to do green jobs. And so we're putting ourselves in a position where by us not fully engaging on the other two points of this bill, which is what are the replacements and how do we get it into society? If we can find the replacements and get it into society, we're going to create the green jobs without a $3.3 trillion tax. And so we need to engage ourselves. And at the end of the day, climate change is, is, is an issue that we're going to have to deal with. This is the most significant issue to the environmentalists. They're spending $200, $300 million this year on an ad campaign. The energy, uh, the, the, the energy industry, all of them, divide it so there's really no opposition. And even without opposition, they're having a hard time getting the bill passed. So if there was anything I could leave you with, it's in an energy producing area, New Mexico, the Dakotas, we have a chance to begin turning around Democratic senators because it involves jobs in their state. And I think at the end of the day, we, we've got to know what the debate is, we've got to engage, and at the end, if we make them understand, if we educate them, I think we'll uh, have a lot of benefits. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. See, I can't, I can't even see the, the microphone. It's just driving me crazy.